What's going on, everybody? I'm Robert Babiak. I'm joined by my producer, Matt Best. And today, we are talking to the legendary cut man, Stitch Duran. Thanks for tossing to us, Stitch. Hey, I'd be confused with the name Babiak also. Oh, my God. <laughs> my whole life, my whole life, people have just been mispronouncing my last name. Yeah. And then I look at these UFC guys I have to talk to this week. Right. I'm having to like watch YouTube videos, go through it. And I'm like, I don't want to be that guy because I know how I would tell my entire life people can't do it. Yeah, you know, that's one thing. I can do anything but be a commentator. <laughs> Pronouncing last names is a little difficult for me. Yeah, and like I'll get like baby act and I'm like, oh God. I can't <laughs> tell if they're intentionally doing it or they just like don't know how to say things yeah. phonetically. Yeah. But what's what's life like like right now for you? Like what what are you doing? It's good. I'm staying busy, thank God. Yeah. You know, it's been a blessing. Uh, I just came back from San Antonio, did a show there uh for the zone. Work with Jessica McCatsko and uh, uh, just and then two weeks in New York, back to back with Top Rank. Uh, just finished Creed three uh, three weeks ago, so I've been busy. Yeah, and like, so do you ever get a break? Like, do you get to relax and take time off, or yeah, is it what, just constant go go go? What does Stitch do for fun? Like, it sounds like you're always on the go. You look like a guy yeah. who likes to fish or hunt or be outside. Or am I completely off base? Yeah, you're completely okay, off base. Okay, I man. tried. Yeah, yeah, good. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't do much of the outdoors. Uh, no, I spend family time. Yeah, you know, it's in, 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 it's not as bad as it seems, uh, because let's say San Antonio, I get there Thursday, do the fight. Saturday, I'm home Sunday. Mm -hmm. New York, I was there for 10 days, but I had my wife with me. Uh, but Monday through Wednesday, Monday through Thursday, for the most part, I'm home doing nothing. I'll go check. I'll go to the Mayweather gyms or Bones Adams gym and just kind of talk to the guys and, you know, barbershop talk like we're doing here. Yeah. So I'm not living a bad life, bro. I got to let you know. It sounds good. It sounds good. You know, it's relaxing. funny. My, my wife's at, I think, 10 o'clock at night. She says, let's have some coffee. I said, are you sure? She said, yeah, why? Because we can. Yeah. You know, so yeah. we're at that point where uh, we've been blessed and, you know, getting plenty of work and uh, enjoying life. Yeah. So speaking of fighting, because I had this, I was watching a video about you a few weeks ago and I'm, I had the thought. So when you're watching a fight, are you watching the fighter or are you watching a monitor or a mixture of both to see what you might have to be working on? No, that's a good question. No, it's, uh, my whole focus is on the fighter's face. Yeah. You know, and of course, you know, I'm, I'm also evaluating uh, how he's doing if he's winning the fight or the round, mm -hmm. you know, little things. I put those into my memory bank. And then when the time comes, if it comes, then uh, I'll make a decision uh, regarding something like that. When you do make the decision and you're just face to face and all the noises around you, did you find it hard to block out all the noise when you're trying to do your work when you first started? No, nah, you, know, well, you guys got good questions. <laughs> it's a, it, believe it or not, it's, it's like a tunnel between me and the fighter, you know, and uh, he hears me and, and, and I try to show as much confidence in me as I can. Right. But that's a good question. So when there's mayhem going on, because some of these fights, it can get pretty rowdy. There's stuff going on or there's confusion. Like someone didn't bring the stool in for some reason or something like that. You're still tuned in tunnel vision. You're just trying to grab the guy and make sure you're getting what you can do, even if, say, the stool isn't sitting there. Yeah. That's, uh, and, and you know what I do? Because I work with so many young fighters, new fighters for the first time. But I'll sit down with the corner and I'll say, all right, Robert, here's your job. Boom, Matt, here's what you do. Boom, here's what I do. So we already have in our mind what we're going to be doing mm -hmm. position-wise. At this level, it doesn't happen that often. Yeah, <laughs> and then when it does happen, that's what everybody can talk about. Because I remember one of the UFC events, the bag of ice ripped open, and there was just ice all over the cage. And then Joe Rogan does this famous clip of him commentating them trying to clean it up. So, I mean, those situations are rare, but when it happens, I guess it's just mayhem. Yeah, you know, and you bring that up, that's a good point, because in the old days, I just... Some commissions don't allow sandwich bags anymore. Mm -hmm. I like them because the cold penetrates right off the bat. But a lot of the guys, like that example, they don't know how to lock them in in place mm -hmm. and all that. Or they use it as an advantage to spill the ice and give his fight a little bit more time. So, you know, there's uh, pros and cons to everything. When yeah. you were talking about, like, earlier when you first started kind of thing, are there anything that changed throughout the years that you wish could just come back? No, actually, it's gotten better as a goal, you know, as a game, as you get more education. Good question. As you get more education, you kind of learn to make your adjustments a little bit better. But, you know, in the old days, uh, the only rules is there were no rules, right? And, you know, you could use whatever medications you wanted and whether you know what you're doing or not, you know, uh, but everything has been regulated now, mm -hmm. which makes it a lot easier and safer for the fighters. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because you, you saw Greg Hardy, maybe even last year, he used a puffer inside the cage and everyone goes like well you can't do that yeah. and if you 
20 years ago, a guy might have been able to get away with doing something like that. I always thought about a puffer like for oxygen. Yeah, yeah, because he yeah. has asthma, I believe. Yeah, to me, why not? It makes sense. You know, yeah. to oxygen is what you need for your blood flow and, and just for your stability. Mm. But I always thought that long time ago, why not get a portable oxygen mask in, in between rounds, mm -hmm. have them suck in oxygen? Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So speaking of experience, after you've been a cut man for a guy a certain amount of times, do you have an idea in your head where he's likely to get cut because of where he's been cut before because of scar tissue and stuff like that? No, you know, it's funny. People bring up scar tissue, but it really, because you have scar tissue doesn't mean you're going to guarantee to get cut in that one spot. Mm -hmm. You know, everything's angles and techniques and all that. But nah, you know, I, I always prefer for the worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. And uh, scar tissue doesn't seem to be one of them. Yeah. <laughs> you're talking about worst case scenario. Is there any spot on the face where if you get hit there, you're like, oh my goodness, this is going to be a lot of fun to clean up right now. Yes, yes. And uh, that big vein we have when we laugh. Right. When that one gets popped, you could expect blood in the eyes and uh, the fighter being as, at a disadvantage and having a tough time stopping the fight mm -hmm. or, or the, having a tough time stopping the cut. Yeah, uh, because it's just going to bleed so much. That's the worst case scenario. Right. That, go ahead, Rob. So when that big vein starts going, that's when you'll see potentially the fight get stopped because there's so much blood running into the guy's eyes. So that's really like the doomsday scenario. One hundred percent. Jay Haran, when he fought Jonathan Goulet yep. from a Canadian, right? Jonathan gave him a knee, and and that big vein we talked about, he literally severed it, and Jay Haran had blood from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. And, of course, him and Jonathan are grappling. So Jonathan Goulet has blood top of the head to the bottom of his feet. So when Jonathan gets back, I'm wiping him down. I'm trying to clean all the blood. And there's so much blood, it made me nauseated, <laughs> right? Uh, but I knew that cut was going to be tough to stop. And I think the ringside doctor asked me, you know, uh, Stitch, are you going to be able to control it? Yeah, yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. You know, so I plug it up with the Vaseline and adrenaline chloride mix that I put. I covered it, and as soon as I covered it, the blood just spurted right through the Vaseline, so I knew uh, they were going to stop it down the road. How hard is it for you to prioritize just certain injuries to the face when you have that limited amount of time with the fighter? Uh, uh, what puts the fighter at a, at a disadvantage first? Uh, usually cuts up above the eyes where the blood gets into the eyes. Those are the worst-case scenarios. Uh, the cheek, the nose, yeah, you know, they look bad cosmetically, right. but they're not going to be a disadvantage to the fighter. How often are you in communication with the doctor then? Is it only when there's a potential fight ending cut or is there communication a little bit if, in case they might see something or how's that play out? You guys are pretty good here. <laughs> we I came like prepared. That. We got to talk to uh, Stish. We got to know. I see that, man. Yeah, that's a good question, but you know, I always try to meet with the doctors and, and let them know. For the most part, they know, but keep that line of communications open, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I know what... I, I, I know more than a lot of doctors, not that I'm a doctor, but I've done enough fights to know when a fighter's an advantage or disadvantage. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the questions that was brought up was uh, Nate when he fought in New York. Yep. You know, that cut that he had here and here should it have been stopped. <clears throat> in California or Nevada, it wouldn't have because mm -hmm. it's not a disadvantage. But the cuts were big enough where, you know, you got to work. Caution is number one. The doctor stopped the fight and, you know, you, you could complain, and, and, uh, but he probably did the right thing. Yeah, and you got a situation in New York, too, especially with MMA, where they were really raw into it, and they were trying to come through. Video review was a problem for a little while, and just the referees in general there was issues with. So it takes time for that stuff to develop. Have you noticed a large change in terms of, like, the regulations and stuff over the past 10 years? Well, you know, in New York, for sure. And, and what happened there is I was working with uh, heavyweight Alex Garcia, I think Cuban fighter. He fought, I couldn't pronounce the last name, he was a Russian fighter. But the Russian fighter, it was a, it was a, a brutal fight. Mm -hmm. The Russian fighter, uh, after that, started having symptoms of dementia or of, of CT. Yep. And they ended up going to the hospital. And he ended up being seriously hurt. Mm -hmm. And so New York made all these major adjustments, which was probably more of an overkill, but better safe than sorry, that yep. type of situation. But the, the rules have improved uh, in, in regulating uh, who works on fighters and how you work on fighters and what medications are allowed and, and all that. So the game has progressed to some point. So is there a rule that you wish like you could instill into the UFC and just any kind of martial arts? Like if there's oh, something uh, out there that you're like, this definitely has to be in there. You know, the bare knuckle fights, mm. uh, Dave Feldman does a great job in, in pro, uh, putting those out. But there's, uh, there's a rule there that I like. 
where cuts are inevitable. Right. You know, they're yeah. not as bad as MMA cuts, but they're inevitable, multiple cuts, right? So the referee has the point to stop the fight, bring the fighter to me as the doctor evaluates him, and I have 30 seconds to work on him to see if I could control the bleeding. If the doctor gives the okay, then they send him back out. I think MMA should implement that rule also. I like uh, that. Ground and pound uh, when a fighter's head's on the canvas. I think that that should be eliminated. Mm -hmm. You know, we look at long-term damage, you know, the dementia pugilistica. And, you know, I, I've been in boxing for so long. I work with so many guys that you can see the speech patterns right. taking shape yeah. for dementia pugilistica. Well, I'm seeing that now with MMA, right? That the, the game has gotten older. The fighters have been in the game a lot longer now. I'm still starting to see slurred speech and, you know, uh, everything that goes with dementia. So is there ever a conversation because when you look at you and you look at other fighters together there's such a comfortable just rapport between the two of you are you comfortable enough with the fighters to be after the fight and go maybe it's time to look at a post-career change or something new here like is that new for you uh, well you know i've done it before you know and and do it in the side of i'm here to take care of you and they know i'm here to take care of you mm -hmm. you know and uh but yeah you know it's it's happened and you gotta kind of come forward and especially with you know if you have more experience and than the team that's with you. And, and nothing worse than having a team sending a fighter out, even though he's getting beat up. Right. I did a show in New York, and, and this kid is getting beat up to the point where one of the top-ranked staff is yelling, stop the fight, stop the fight. And, you know, people, the commissioners are coming in, and, but the, 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 it was a father-son combination. Oh. And those are the hardest because they deal with, not with, with their heart yep. and not with common sense. And uh, they ended up stopping the fight. So and it's you, probably his last fight. Do you have a preference between being a cut man for an MMA fighter or a boxing fighter? Like, how does that end up playing out for you? No, Which one they're, do you like you more? Know, they're, they're all the same. I, bare knuckle fights, I know I'm guaranteed work. Yeah. If I do <laughs> MMA, I know a probably high probability of getting work. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've done all these fights. I haven't worked in a cut in boxing. And, and I've done, I mean, in New York, the two Saturdays I did five. I worked five of the ten shows on each show. Mm -hmm. So that's ten fights. And then... Uh, I was in San Antonio, and I think I did four, uh, four fights, and none of these guys got cut. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but, but boxing pays more, yeah. which is nice. So I know you've talked a lot of the, this before, but maybe there's a new number one. What's the worst cut that you've been able to stop up in MMA so far to get a guy back out there? Uh, well, you know, the, of course, the one with Forrest Griffith yeah. when he fought Shogun, right? Yep. That was a classic uh, uh, cut for me to come out because he popped that big vein and mm -hmm. I threw everything, the whole kitchen sink in there. And, uh, you know, luckily uh, he ended up winning the fight and uh, a week later I checked my mail and there's a nice gift certificate mm -hmm. to a restaurant. You yeah. Know, so Forrest uh, appreciated that. That's nice. I didn't yeah. know fighters gave gift certificates and things I didn't like either. that. <laughs> yeah. Well, Brock Lesnar, well, yeah, I know it. It's me neither. I mean, Brock Lesnar, I'm wrapping his hands and, and I'm telling him how, you know, uh, I like his shirt and, mm -hmm. and uh, he said, well, I pack one for you. I said, wow. You know, I said, wow. He goes, no, my wife did. She asked me as she's packing my clothes, should I get one for Stitch? And he said, yeah. So after I finished wrapping his hands and putting the gloves on, he reached in his bag and gave me a shirt. So speaking of hands, has that adapted at all when you're wrapping guys' hands? Have you changed that in the last 10 years? No, no, not at all. You know, what worked when I started with the UFC works mm -hmm. now. Uh, there's different... I use the same foundation. Yeah. Uh, let's say I wrap your hands and, and you have an issue with metacarpals. Mm -hmm. All right. I'll, I'll talk to you before I start wrapping his hand, your hands, and I'll make the adjustments. I'll put it tighter here, tighter there, a little bit more padding here. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'll make the adjustments uh, uh, for the fighter. And like this one kid that uh, fought Saturday, uh, he had issues with his hands. So excuse me, I locked him up. And after the fight, I asked him how they felt. He goes, no, they felt good. Mm -hmm. You know, so you take that away. And like I say, I'm not going to fix your injury. It's just not going to get any worse than mm -hmm. it is now. So with the bare knuckle, when you're doing hand wraps for that. I don't do hand wraps for that. You don't do hand that's wraps for that? That's great. Yeah, bare knuckle. You know? Right. No, oh, no so, well, right. they, they yeah, do it. The, that's what I meant. <laughs> yeah. Travis will, will snip that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, that's, uh, yeah, bare knuckle fights. But, you know, they... They asked me to, yeah, uh, and but I said no, you know, because I don't know that technique, mm -hmm. and I don't want to be accountable for your, yeah, if you have an injury. Yeah, right? so they just do a basic rip, wrist wrap then. Yeah, for they, 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 yeah, the, the metacarpal, the thumb, and the wrist. Yeah, and, and it's we one inch, two inches away from the knuckles. Mm -hmm. That's interesting because I get, I think a lot of people may, maybe watched the first few events of those, but haven't realized that sports developed rapidly since they started doing the events. Yeah, 
Yeah, I think they're in England right now. Yeah, they are. Um, yeah. MVP is fighting. Um, yeah. Now I'm spacing on the guy's name, and I feel bad. Yeah. He's fighting a former UFC fighter, though. When it was a very surprise situation to see MVP, who's yeah. a huge guy in belt, or just go, yeah, I'm going to do a bare-knuckle boxing match. It's crazy. It's a um, different world for these guys. Yeah, I guess yeah. The, the, like, it's real different now when we're starting to see another situation where there's a competitor to the UFC, so you've got Bellator who's really doing well, PFL is doing a lot of stuff, Ryzen over in Japan, 1FC. We're starting to get back into that situation where there's multiple promotions, so then there's a lot of different moving pieces and a lot yeah. of different stuff going on yeah. back. Like, I mean, the old Pride, did you ever go over to Pride to have to do sure. any cut work? Oh, yeah, plenty of, plenty of fights with Josh Barnett. Yeah. I, uh, you know, uh, Fedor Emelianco, right? Mm -hmm. uh, one of the guys I work with many times, but uh, Josh, after he left the UFC, he took me with him, and guys would want me to wrap their hands, right? Mm -hmm. And and just take it for granted because we did in the UFC. Yeah. But Josh says, no, I pay to bring him here. If you want him to wrap your hands, it's going to cost you 500 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I'd make two, three grand easy like this, bro. <laughs> rap, I, remember rap, the, rap. I remember the first time I got paid from the Japanese, they put it in envelopes. So I go to the bathroom like I'm, like I'm going pee. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'll put that in my back pocket. Yeah. So anyway, the promoter asked me, Fedor had just come back from breaking his thumb. Mm -hmm. And uh, the promoter came and asked me if I would wrap his hands. And I said, yeah, of course. You know, I didn't even talk money or nothing. So I go to the dressing room, and, and I've worked with a lot of Russians, so I understand they're very quiet, and you gotta, you gotta, they have to accept you, right? So I'm trying to talk to Fedor, and he's not saying nothing. We're open and close and open and close. Finally, I finished wrapping his hands. I said, okay, how do they feel? He looks at him and goes, super, super. <laughs> Bro, that's all he said, man. And I walked out, my feet weren't even touching the ground. And <laughs> after the fights, Josh and I are walking uh, to the bus, and Fedor had just won, and he calls us in, and they said, Placebo, you drink vodka, we drink. So we took shots of vodka with <laughs> Fedor. And, uh, and, you know, so we always kept that relationship. And when I was with Bellator, the last uh, show I did with them, was in San Jose, and mm -hmm. I walk into the hotel after coming in from the airport, and Fedor's there with his team, and he comes up to me, and he don't show a lot of emotion, right? But he gives me a hug. He says, <laughs> I have sweats for you. So he ran the guy up, brought my sweats, and had my name on them. And what made that special is that those were done when he was in Russia. So he thought of me. I'm not even part of his team. Right. But he thought of me enough mm -hmm. to make me a pair of sweats. The fighter that's fighting MVP – is platinum Mike Perry. Oh, I remembered Mike it Perry. now. There you go. Yeah, yeah. see? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It still works up here now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> this is a question that I think you've maybe never been asked. Have you ever had to use your cut man expertise outside of the ring? Oh, yeah, it has been as I just mentioned it a while ago. So I, uh, I did a show at the Staples Center, and the hotel's three blocks away. So mm -hmm. we're walking. You know, I got my bag in tow, and, and the other cut man, we're walking to the hotel, and Fans are taking pictures and this and that. And then to the side, I see a couple guys. I think they're, they're playing around, right? And a couple older guys, and, and they're scuffling while the son of one of the guys goes and cracks the other guy and drops him on the floor and knocks him out. And I'm from here to Travis away, and I said, well, let me get my stuff. I get over there, and he has a big old UFC cut right here because he, he fell this way. So I'm working on him, and he comes through, and he looks at me. He says, Stitch, I can't, believe, I can't believe you're working on me. Oh, you know, what a day. So I have the gauze on the cut, and I tell the guy, hold on to this. Take him to the hospital. He's going to need stitches. You know? So, yeah, so that did happen. That's probably the best story of that guy's life. Oh, yeah, I'm telling you, he says, Stitch, I can't believe you're working on me. Yeah, of course. That's got to be, that's like the pinnacle situation for a guy to hop into. And, you know, when he's trying to tell people this story afterwards, yeah. I bet people probably wouldn't even believe him. Yeah, well, I think there's something on YouTube with if somebody taped it and somebody showed it. And, oh, really? Yeah. That's awesome. But, uh, we'll have to yeah. look at that. Oh, Stitch, I can't believe you're working on me. <laughs> so, yeah. speaking of working on guys, though, so you worked with Tyson Fury before. I did. What's he like outside of the camera, not with a microphone in front of his face? Is he the same guy? Super, super, super guy, man. And, you know, I worked with Vladimir Klitschko yep. and Tyson Fury beat him, right? So I can never understand why this guy beat Vladimir Klitschko, which is a guy that's so disciplined in Vladimir against a guy like Tyson Fury that mm -hmm. looks, don't even look like a fighter. Yep. But when I saw him fight Deontay Wilder, I became a fan because technique-wise he did everything right. Mm -hmm. And when I started working with him, uh, what a pleasure, mm -hmm. you know, to come in. Uh, I walk into Top Rank Gym, and he's lacing up his shoes, and he stands up and, Stitch, welcome to the team, best cut man in the business. And then we're talking and going over his cuts, and 
tell them what I'm going to do. I'm going to keep ice on you every round. I don't wait till things happen. And then I say, well, you know, Tyson, I work with sponsors. Do you mind if I make an outfit, my cornerman jacket, to match your colors and put my sponsors? He puts his hand on my shoulder and says, Stitch, you can do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. As long as there's no gambling, uh, drugs, uh, or alcohol. And sure enough, you know, he let me put my sponsors on. So uh, what a nice guy. And then on my last one, uh, last fight with him, uh, with Deontay Wilder, I sat down with him and I told him, I'm going to keep ice on you every round. I'm not going to wait till stuff happens and I know the type of fight you're going to be in, right? Well, I'm saying goodbye. And he has his shorts on. All these people are in the dressing room and I'm taking off. And I said, all right, Tyson, we'll see you later. He says, Stitch, thanks for keeping ice on me and give me a kiss on the cheek. Said, Thank you. you know? So these are the kind of moments that, uh, uh, that I get, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, so maybe you could hear. I'm going to. Vladimir Klitschko was one of the guys that I worked with for eight years. Mm -hmm. Right. Him and Vitaly. So when I did the Creed movie, uh, Michael B. Jordan acted and directed in it. But him and the producers came and asked me who should give the WBC belt away, the green belt. So I gave him the history. It's a Mexican uh, Jose Suleiman created it, should be given away by a Mexican guy. And there was a guy we chose from the, uh, the extras to give the belt away. So I'm talking to Jose Suleiman or Mauricio, his son, that the father already passed on how we represented the WBC at its mm -hmm. highest level. And being that both brothers uh, fought and defended the WBC belt, he says, well, let's take a picture and let's send it to these guys. And they're in the middle of the war, mm -hmm. keep in mind. Yep. Vitaly's the mayor and Vladimir's the spokesperson, but I'm going to let you guys listen to this, what Vladimir said to me, and it gives me chills even now. But listen to this. My two favorite men, especially Stitch, with whom I spent so much time talking, and he actually saved my career yeah, on a lot of different stages. Uh, if Stitch wouldn't be in my corner, I would not make the record of 12 years being a champion. So um, that's, that's so great to see you both, and Stitch is the man. Yeah. That's incredible. It's mm -hmm. incredible, you know. Especially, it's, uh, <laughs> you're out. Especially mm -hmm. under the circumstances. Yeah. You know, for him to, I guess maybe I took him out of that mentality mm -hmm. for that moment to think, well, wow, you know. Yeah. But I love these guys, man. And you can you know? tell that he's so genuine with it, too, mm -hmm. in that voice message. Like, you don't even need to see his face. Yeah, right. he, he just sounds so eternally grateful. Oh, I tell you, it choked me up, man, when mm -hmm. Mauricio sent me this. You know? Yeah. I said, wow. And I'm Ukrainian too, so those oh, yeah. two guys are. Oh yeah, they're, they're, what they're doing is very honorable. Oh, and brave. it's very honorable, man. And the yeah. fact that they, the career, both of those guys are just absolute animals. And then they go, and then they're being public servants. It's just amazing to see the two, because people would say, "Oh, a boxer, they're going to be brash and you know, know aggressive," and that's not really the case, right? No, these guys, of all the people I've worked with throughout all my careers, by far, they sit up on top of the total mm -hmm. pole, right? And uh, it's just that they were very humble with people. Mm -hmm. They stop. You want a picture and autograph? You're going to get a picture and autograph. That's mm -hmm. nice. You know, they had security, but security was very f relaxed. That's the way they are. Mm -hmm. And that's the way they were. And everything that they did was first class. I feel like they just enjoy giving back because they sacrificed so much to get to where they are yeah. that they're just trying to be nice to the other people who may be trying to sacrifice so much to get into their shoes. Yeah, 100%. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and like say, on, uh, when Vladimir retired... Uh, they invited the whole team to Austria, up up in the Alps, with their training center, gorgeous place. Mm -hmm. And they brought us in for the weekend just to say thank you for mm -hmm. doing what we did. And, I've got uh, one final question for you. Sure. Did acting come naturally to you, or was that really something you had to work on? <laughs> I, I'm not an actor. I don't want to be an actor. I can't act with the shit. Yeah. <laughs> all right, I'm good at, all right, let's go one more round. <laughs> That's about it, man. But my wife keeps telling me, no, I'm not an actor. Yeah. But I've been, I've been blessed to be in seven movies. You know, so I can't complain. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm happy doing what I am. But now I got my Screen Actors Guild, and I think uh, Creed 2, you know, because they kept saying, ah, you got to get your Screen Actors Guild. I said, no, nah, I'm not an actor. I don't want to mm -hmm. be an actor, <laughs> right? And But on this one, they kind of forced it on me, but mm -hmm. production paid for it. Yeah. You know, it was like 3500 bucks, and, you know, so now I have their insurance and mm, all that. That's so, awesome. Yeah, so I guess I'm an actor, but I'm not an actor. Yeah, no, I mean, it's that's a fair thing. I think there's a lot of guys that try to transition from – one thing to another. It's just so interesting with you that you've been such an expert at that one thing and then been able to be very successful, even though you're saying you're not an actor, but you have to be in the role and get in the mindset to do it still. So. Oh God. Yeah. No, listen, the roles that I've gotten and have been 
tremendous just playing mm -hmm. myself yeah you yeah. know so <laughs> easiest so it, role yeah. yeah so it doesn't get much better than that how can you complain about that no right? you can't but it was funny i mean greg was michael b jordan because yeah. you know i was his cut man all the time and right. every day him and i are like this i'm wrapping his hands and and we're talking yeah and and uh you know i want to make sure that things are done right and whatever you know so on creed 2 i'm telling him how proud i am of of him and tessa thompson and ryan coogler who wrote and directed creed and and directing Black Panther and, and Steve Kappel, the director. Michael looks at me and says, and like this, he says, Stitch, we went from being actors to writers, producers, directors. And he says, I'm directing Creed 3, and you're with me as long as you want. That's mm -hmm. incredible. That's incredible. So yeah. Michael B. Jordan, I think there's no better person to ask this question to other than you. You know the famous clip where Michael B. Jordan actually gets knocked out during the filming? Is there anybody you've ever worked with in acting that is in, as intense as Michael B. Jordan when it comes to just being in combat movies. No, you know what? He, he, gave, he gave it all. Well, Kevin James. Let, let, let me revert, rewind a little bit. Mm -hmm. Here comes the boom. Right. Yep. Tremendous athlete. Tremendous athlete. He lost all this weight and all that. And let me give you a little behind-the-scenes story. We still got time. No, right? we have absolutely. Time. All, right, all, all the time right, in the yeah, world. Yeah. All the so, time in the world. So, you know, once again, I get the script, and you get residuals if you say lines, right? Mm, yep. And I just got a check from Here Comes the Boom the other day. So I didn't have no lines. And I'm thinking, man, I got to change that somehow. <laughs> you know? So I'm thinking, and before I even get to Massachusetts, and, uh, but when it's time for us to do our scene with Kevin, he says, Stitch, come here, man. We got to have you say something. Mm -hmm. So I think, all right. Well, I already had it laid out. I said, well, you know, here's what I tell the fighters is, welcome to the UFC. Ah, oh, that's great. That's great. So during the scene, he gets cut. They call me in. Ah, oh, Stitch, I can't believe you're working on me. I'm a big fan of yours. Oh, what a day I'm having. Boom, boom, boom. And then, like I do fighters, I slapped them. I walk them to the UFC. <laughs> then I walked off, right? Well, it, nobody knew I was going to slap them. <laughs> Everybody started laughing. Uh, you'll see it in the movie. Yeah. You know? Boom, welcome to the UFC. Oops. Boom, welcome to the UFC. Wow. So that was my million-dollar line. So is there anything else that you're up to? Is there anything you want to plug? Like, what's, yeah, what's going on with you? Yeah, I'm doing a lot of things. God, I've, you know, I've been really blessed. I'm uh, working with a CBD company that uh, created a cream for cuts, the healing process of mm -hmm. cuts, right? So when Jay uh, Tim's called me, uh, and I get calls all the time, you know, from different products. And this, I turned down a tequila company because the name just didn't fit my, right. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but this one, I said, well, look, let's go to the bare knuckle fights. They get cut all the time. Uh, they get sewn up in the dressing room. Uh, go in there, take a picture of them, give them the cream, let them apply it every day, have them send you results back a week later. Mm -hmm. And the results have been tremendous. And uh, now we're starting to expand and going further into uh, getting that out to uh, not only the fighters, but cosmetics and, mm -hmm. you know, the plastic surgery for healing. Yep. It's a healing process. But, the you know, when we get off, I'll show you some of the pictures. and They're, yeah. they're tremendous. You I've know? seen you have, you have your own wraps too, right? I have my own tape. Yep. yep. Stitch, uh, stitch wraps. Have my own end swell, uh, the KO swell, mm -hmm. the, the metal that we use. Uh, but yeah, try to refine and make this game better and better. Well, I appreciate you coming through. I told you I'd tell you a secret at the end of this. This is the first interview I've ever done since I retired from coaching professional hockey. How would I do? No kidding. You got the voice, bro. Yeah. Well, you got all this stitched around here. Uh, tell me about your hockey days, man, because, <laughs> you know, we Mexicans don't get on the ice too much, but you guys being Canadians, I think you're kind of born on the ice, right? Yeah. So, so I grew up, I have no athletic ability whatsoever, as you can see, but I always had the mindset for it. And I was so just invested in all the small aspects of it. I would dissect the minor professional hockey leagues that no one would ever talk about. And then I went to university, not knowing what I wanted to do, but I did a sport management degree. And then I just got a coach, his name's coach Joe Pace, who just gave me an opportunity. And yeah. as time went on, he just kept asking me to do more stuff, do more stuff. And then I was 26 or 25 years old and I was coaching semi pro or minor professional hockey in uh, Watertown, New York. Wow. And so it was a really strange environment to be in because like I worked so hard to get to a place and then people were like, oh, but you didn't play. How'd right, you right, do it? Yeah. It was just very strange. It's like a boxing coach that didn't box is something that happens sometimes, but sure. hockey coaches, not very often. So it was just a very, I, I guess I learned a lot and it was a really character developing type of experience yeah it's called common sense yeah right you know and then like i said my, my job as a cut man it's common sense mm -hmm. you know how do you stop a cut well direct pressure yeah you know so well congratulations you know to do what you're doing and I, i've been to one hockey game and that was in vancouver yeah i, I think uh what's the the super bowl called the uh stanley cup stanley cup yeah so there was this one guy that uh 
was supporting some of the military troops. Mm-hmm. So he had tickets, so he invited me to the to the hockey, and I knew like this much about it. Right. But I had fans all over that were stitch, 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 <laughs> kill. So that was kind of nice. I just thought of something that I have to talk to you about. There is a big thing in hockey with fighting and enforcers, and it's become less and less prevalent as time has gone on. But there is an organization that does hockey fight matches where guys wear MMA gloves. They get into a small on ice rink, little ring they've set up, and they fight each other with rounds in a boxing style format. It is the most interesting thing I've ever seen, and I can't believe it exists. But I have, I'll send you a clip of it. It is with, wild. With, with uh, skates on? Skates on. All the equipment they would have on except for the visor. But they put MMA gloves on so that way, because they do in a, tur- a tournament in the same night, the guy might fight three times. And it's just ah. insanity to sit there and see. Cause, I've never heard that. Yeah, yeah that you're going to slip and fall, hit your head on the ice. You know, like There's a lot of things that can happen in that. But you see the guys cutting their hands up because of the helmets. They're getting it either on the screws that are on the helmet or on the side of the plastic, just gashing their hands up. So they put the MMA gloves on, but you still see them cut up hands and stuff. It's wild. And, and let me ask you this, Coach, because have any of your guys, or do you know how many guys have got cut with the skates themselves? Yeah, so I have had a couple guys get not it, – it's always like in this position here, uh. right on where your watch is. <clears throat> so some guys started wearing guards in this position, so in that way they couldn't get their wrist sliced. Yeah, but it's called suicide. <laughs> the worst things I have seen is guys destroying their knuckles because they punch the helmet so often. And there's, it comes to a certain point where these guys so late in their careers, 45 years old, fighting. There's a league in Canada that's known as basically the fighting league. It's yeah. LNAH. Some of these guys have like 500 hockey fights. And you look at their hands, they're the demolished. And it's yeah. just bare knuckle hitting wow. a helmet constantly. That's insane. They but, need a stitch between rounds. Well, for honestly, sure. they do. And that I want to find out if these teams actually have a... A guy that's more specialized in that. Somebody in house, yeah. Yeah, you could have a doctor. You would have to, yeah. If you have a doctor, maybe they necessarily don't know how to take care of some some of these things. And some of these guys might fight three times a night. That's crazy. Absolutely yeah. wild. But I ha- yeah, I can't believe I didn't think of bringing that up to you. But <laughs> I appreciate you taking the time. This Thank was you. really fun. Um, we'll have to talk again sometime soon. Anytime. We'll I bring you to a hockey you. game forever in Toronto. All right, yeah. How do we'll do that? Be, yeah, well, I might, well, maybe I won't be there in, in August. <laughs> yeah, because the airport. The flights, yeah, the know? airport in Canada yeah. is Toronto airport nightmare. All right. Well, thanks for having me on. Thank Appreciate you so much. It. Thank Thanks. you so much. Thank you, guys.